Hey, let's start exploring systems in two dimensions now. We're going to start with a classical example that illustrates the competition between two species that share the same habitat and um, food resources. Okay, so let's just talk a little bit before we go into this stuff. Let's just talk a little bit about what the model looks like and what that means in terms of the context. Here we have two different species, which we're labeling as N1 and N2. And the assumptions of our model are number one, that both species are growing logistically on their own, and that number two, both species are losing out with their interactions with the other species. Let's see how these play out in the model. So for species N1, if I just cover up the term here that includes interaction with the second species, then this is the logistic model. Um, it looks a little different than it usually does because it's written in a different way. But really, we have the same continuous growth rate assumption here, and we have the same 1 minus n over k term here, which you can see if you divide k1 by k1 here, then the first term here is just a 1, and then minus n1 over k1. So this is the same logistic growth that we have. And if we repeat that exercise on species 2, you can see that n2 is also obeying the logistic growth equation. Okay. And then if we look at these two terms right here, which include interactions of the other species, you can see that the interaction is being modeled as a product of the two species' populations, because you can see the N2 here is being multiplied by the N1 right there. So remember, interactions are usually modeled as species 1 times species 2. And the other thing is, we can express either that a species benefits from the interaction or that the interaction is detrimental to the species. And if the species is benefiting, then there will be a positive coefficient in front of the interactive term, which is not true here. It's a negative coefficient, and that means that species 1 is actually losing out every time species 2 gets up in its face. Okay, that's what the negative alpha is for, and likewise the negative beta saying the same thing is true about species 2, that it doesn't really want to interact with species 1, and if it does, it kind of loses out due to that. And that's because these two species are competing with each other. This is different than your predator-prey model, where when the predator and the prey interact, the predator actually gains from that. Both species are losing from the interaction because they're just competing for the same resources. Okay, so we're going to start our analysis by simply solving for the equilibrium points. Simply. Remember how simple that was in one dimension? You just had to set one equation equal to zero. Well, in two dimensions, you have to set two equations equal to zero at the same time in order for it to be in equilibrium. This is generally true about an n-dimensional system, is that all n state equations must be equal to zero at the same time. Simultaneously, they all have to equal zero in order for the entire system to be in equilibrium. So in two dimensions, they both have to be equal to zero at the same time. And this is, easiest, um, this is easiest for you to understand using a graph. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to graphically illustrate the simultaneous nature of both of these being equal to zero at the same time by using two different colors. I'm going to set species 1 equal to zero in blue. And I'm going to call those the N1 no climb. I'm going to set species 2's rate equation equal to 0 in red, and I'm going to call that the N2 null climb. Null climbs are curves where the DDT, or the time derivative, is equal to 0 just for the one variable. That's why N1 in blue has its own null climbs. That's just when I set the top equation equal to 0. And likewise, N2's null climbs in red are going to be the places where just the bottom equation is equal to 0. But remember, I said for an equilibrium point to exist, they both have to be zero at the same time. So we're going to graph all this junk on a nice uh, two-dimensional state graph here. And then we're going to look for places where the blue lines and the red lines intersect each other. That's going to guarantee that these two things are happening simultaneously. Okay, so in order for just the blue stuff to equal zero, because it's factored out, I can use the factoring trick that for this to be equal to 0, either just this first factor has to equal 0, R1, N1 has to equal 0. And that's where I get the statement that N1 equals 0 is one of the null climbs. Or 
all this stuff that constitutes the second factor, this big thing in the parentheses, that could be equal to zero. And if that's equal to zero, that's going to give me the second statement here. Notice on the second statement that I just took the numerator of the fraction and set that equal to zero. That's because a fraction is equal to zero as long as its numerator is equal to zero and as long as the denominator is not equal to zero at the same time so you don't get zero over zero. Now the denominator is a constant, it's the carrying capacity K1, and that is surely going to be greater than zero. So all I have to do to find out where this second factor will equal zero is simply set the numerator equal to zero, and that's what I've written right here. Okay, now I want to graph the N1 null lines in blue because those are going to be places on the state graph in the state space where dn1 dt is equal to zero. So I'll start with the easy one, which is that um, n1 is equal to zero. And remember that n1 is the horizontal axis. And so a place where n1 is always going to be equal to zero is right here. This is where n1 is equal to zero, and that's going to be illustrated as a vertical line. Okay? Just like that. So that would be the same thing as in pre-calculus if I asked you to graph the line x equals 0. Remember, graphing y equals 0 is a horizontal line, and graphing x equals 0 is a vertical line. So that's why I'm graphing a vertical line here. Technically, this vertical line would be right on top of the axis, but I'm just graphing it to the side a little bit so that you can see it. Okay? So really, this blue line, I'm just emphasizing its existence by graphing it to the side but it is directly over the vertical axis here. This is the null line, n1 equals 0. Okay? Um, the other null line for n1 is this statement right here. Remember, n1 is the x and n2 is the y. I'm used to graphing lines in the form of like y equals mx plus b, and so I solved that statement for n2 so that it would look, look more like the line type that I'm familiar with. So kind of putting it in the context of what you've seen before, n2y is equal to minus n1 over alpha, so the slope is minus 1 over alpha, and then the plus b, or the y-intercept part, is k1 over alpha. So I can see that this is a, slope, this is a line where we have a positive y-intercept and we have a negative slope. Remember, the slope is the coefficient multiplying n1, which is minus 1 over alpha. So I know that I have a line with a positive y-intercept and a negative slope. It's going to look something like that. I don't really have numbers for the parameters right now, but I do have a qualitative ability to visualize it as something with a positive y-axis um, intercept and a negative slope. Okay? So this is the second null line, which is... Um, n2 is equal to, actually, I'm just going to label it as an n1 null line because I have the equation right there, so I don't want to make the graph uh, too dirty. So the blue ones are the n1 null lines, okay? I'm actually going to exclude the labels, otherwise this graph's going to get pretty messy. Okay, the blue lines are places where dn1 dt would always be equal to 0. Now, in red, I'm going to graph places where dn2 dt would be equal to 0. And just like n1, there's two places that that's going to occur. There's two different curves, um, which happen to be lines in this case, on which that will occur. And that's corresponding to setting uh, either this factor or that factor equal to 0. So if we set this factor equal to 0, that's where we get the n2 null line of n2 is equal to 0. And that would be just like graphing something like y equals 0 on an xy plane, and y equals 0 would look like this. It would be a horizontal line. Technically, it would be right on top of the black axis. I just drew it a little off um, so you can see it exists. And also, because if I draw red on top of a black line, it kind of ruins my red marker. So I don't want to draw it right on top. But that is really supposed to be the... Um, that horizontal line that goes right on top of the axis there. Okay, that's the first null line. And then the second null line, just like before, will be found by setting the numerator of this factor equal to zero. And if we do that, we get this statement here, which will be easier for me to think about if I've got it in 
y equals mx plus b format. So that's why I rewrote it here, solving it for n2, and I can see that again. It has a positive y-intercept. For this one, the line uh, has a y-intercept of k2, and it has a negative slope. In this case, the slope on the red null line is minus beta. And so that's going to be something that has a positive y-intercept and a negative slope. Well, I'm not entirely sure what that's going to look like until I really have numbers, because I need to know, like, what's bigger, um, k1 over alpha, or is k2 bigger, in order to know which line is above the other line here. But I'm just kind of doing it theoretically now, so that you can see the equilibrium points pop out. Okay, how many equilibrium points do you see, and where are they? It's really important, and do this on your homework if you can, that we draw the null lines for each variable in their own color. Okay, that's why for the first variable, I use the color blue. Second variable, I use the color red. You want to give each variable their own color because you want to make sure that blue and red are happening at the same time. One blue and one red are intersecting each other. Not a blue versus a, not a blue meeting a blue, not a red meeting a red. It's one blue and one red. And those are the places that are going to define our equilibrium points, is where one blue line meets one red line. Okay, so I can see that that's happening on the graph right here, right here at the fixed point 0, comma 0. That's one equilibrium point. And then looking around on the graph, it looks like the red line intersects the blue line right here as well. That's another equilibrium point. Uh, looking again, I can see that the blue line intersects the red line right here. Here's another point right there. And one more place right in the middle where the blue line intersects the red line right there. So there's actually four equilibrium points total. Now, just to really emphasize this very important point, I want to show you some things that might trick you and look like equilibrium points, but they're not equilibrium points. And those are going to be places where one of the variables null climbs intersects itself. Okay? Take, for example, the N1 null climbs. There's two of them, right? And these two lines do intersect somewhere in this plane. Right here, we see the intersection of a blue line and another blue line. That's two blue lines. That's not an equilibrium point. Because at that point, we have dn1 dt is equal to 0, but we do not have dn2 dt is equal to 0. So right here, this is not an equilibrium point. And likewise, that would, if I had extended these red lines enough, a red line would meet another red line over here. And again, sometimes that can trick you. It can look like an equilibrium point, but it's not. Because it's just a red line meeting another red line. It's not a combination of red meeting blue. So you really got to watch out for that. And it really is best done with two different colors. Because you can imagine that if I did all of this in black, I would have probably got tricked into thinking that there's one, two, three, four, five, six equilibrium points. And there's not. There's just four. Okay, so we can get the algebraic expressions for the equilibrium points simply by analyzing what are the um, y-intercepts and the x-intercepts for the linear functions. And by solving a simultaneous linear equation where we have this and this statement both obeyed at the same time. Um, I don't know how useful that is to you, so maybe I'll just uh, leave that part out. And usually when you're analyzing a system, you'll have numbers for those. Um, so let's not do that part right now. I just want to give you the, uh, the most important part, which is drawing the null lines, making sure that you use a different color for each null line, and then looking for places where you have one color intersect the other. I highly encourage you to try to do this on Desmos, and if you do do it on Desmos, you can use the settings to um, draw two of the things in blue and two of the things in red, and so you can see this um, really clearly whether using technology or whether just using paper and pencil and you got some fun colored pencil.